Okay, so let me uh, continue where I had left off earlier, but I am going to backtrack a little bit and just remind uh, ourselves what we were doing uh, towards the end of the last lecture. So basically what, what I was trying to point out was that um, it is possible to do uh, quantum mechanics using Lagrangians, but uh, in order to do that you have to uh, first understand how to uh, integrate over spaces of functions. So that is the price you have to pay to uh, do quantum mechanics using Lagrangians. So that is uh, very likely the reason why you do not uh, encounter this uh, approach to quantum mechanics in your undergraduate uh, treatments of uh, quantum mechanics because uh, it involves developing some unfamiliar mathematics. So but then uh, I think it is worthwhile to uh, learn how to do this so that uh, you know the, the treatment of fields and field theory especially quantum field theory becomes uh, very convenient if you know how to integrate over spaces of functions. So this is a very uh, rough introduction to the subject where I explain what it means to integrate over spaces of functions. Uh, so uh, if you recall I had uh, started off by pointing out the uh, essential differences between integrating over just uh, real numbers which is the ordinary integration you are familiar with from your uh, you know 12 standard uh, calculus and uh, the distinction between that and integrating over spaces of functions. So, uh, so if you stare at this equation 6.1, basically it tells you that this is uh, what an ordinary integration looks like. It is just integral with respect to x, which where x is uh, some ordinary real number. So now instead of this in functional integration, you are actually integrating not over x, which is a real number, but you are integrating over f, which, which itself is a function of some. So in other words, you are integrating over all possible functions in 6.2. So in 6.1, you are integrating over all possible numbers. So you can see that the space of all possible functions is enormously large compared to the space of all possible numbers, uh, real numbers. So that is easy to intuitively appreciate. So that is the reason why this sort of uh, integration is somewhat unfamiliar and harder to make rigorous sense of. So if you remember how uh, integration was made, integration uh, of this sort, namely integration over real numbers were made sense of in your 12th standard, it was uh, defined as the limit of a sum. That means there was a series and uh, which is basically the area under some curve. So that area was basically you divide up that area into uh, tiny rectangles, uh, you know. Uh, so in other words, if you want to integrate from A to B and this is your curve, so you divide this up into tiny, tiny rectangles and you find the area uh, of each rectangle. And then you add up and take the limit as the number of rectangle goes to infinity and uh, whereas the, the, I mean the width of the rectangle tends to 0 such that the overall uh, means, so in other words you end up spanning the whole uh, interval from A to B. So that is how it was defined in your 12th standard. So similarly, it is desirable to make sense out of that in this case also, but uh, but strictly speaking, you know, in physics we don't really need the, this such an integral by itself, but rather what we need are ratios of uh, two such integrals. So typically, we won't be actually needing this integration itself, but we need to know the ratio between this and something else. Of, of a similar kind. So because you need only ratios, uh, you will see later on that you can actually uh, minimize the effort you have to spend to evaluate this. In other words, you, you, otherwise you have to rigorously define this integral as the limit of a sum the way we had done in 6.1. So in 6.2 also you have to define this as the limit of a sum 
but you can sidestep uh, that necessity of having to do that if you are only interested in the ratios of two such integrals you will soon uh, we will soon find that uh, it's not necessary to spend so much effort dwelling on those uh, technical rigorous aspects which is very fortunate because as physicists we really want to get to the final answer as quickly as possible because our goals are different from that of a mathematician so our goals are to make sense out of the physical world with minimum fuss okay uh, so i was also pointing out that uh, uh, while the uh, an ordinary integration over real numbers is there aren't too many different ways in which you can write say a gaussian integral uh, if it is over real numbers but if it's a functional integral and it has the flavor of a gaussian there are many very many different ways in which you can write down a functional integral that resembles a gaussian one of them is 6.2 here but something else is also possible which is uh, still resembles a gaussian but it's considerably different which is 6.3 because it now it involves a derivative of uh, the function not just the function itself so that that possibility of course doesn't arise at all uh, when you are trying to integrate over ordinary real numbers so uh, so the uh, message here is that when you are integrating over function spaces the the possible varieties that you encounter are tremendously larger than what you would otherwise encounter in ordinary integration so let me try and make sense out of an integral such as 6.3 okay so before i do that i have to set some ground rules so i'm going to assume that uh, these function this function f of x or a, so in other words remember that i am integrating over all possible functions so now the, for any function f of x uh, i'm going to assume it first of all is well defined in this interval when x is between a and b so it's well defined in this interval but now i'm also going to sp uh, specify that uh, the end points are fixed okay so i'm going to specify that f of a is uh, some y1 and f of b is some y2 and which is fixed okay so this is uh, so this is uh, fixed so this is these two are fixed y1 and y2 are fixed so that means the end points are fixed so the question is if the end points are fixed uh, uh, so i have to integrate over all possible functions so imagine that this is y1 and this is y2 and you could have a function which is like this you could have another function so they all start and end the same place but then there are two lots of functions uh, so so in other words you can have functions that do different things in between but they have to start and end at the same place so integrating over functions means integrating over all such paths so different paths they all start and end at the same place but then in in between they do different things so now the question is how would you make sense out of such an integration you have to integrate over all paths so that's why this is sometimes also called a path integral because you are integrating over different function in each function i mean especially if it's the independent variable is just one real number it really does define a path okay so now uh, so uh, the intuitively obvious way of making sense of this is uh, to split up your interval uh, from a to b into pieces so in other words we uh, we imagine that you have these uh, points labeled by x0 which is a and then x1 uh, which is uh, some equidistant from a i mean basically the, so that the successive points are equidistant so we imagine that uh, the successive points are equidistant and we imagine that uh, they are of the sort so this is some some small so you can think of that as some h uh, so uh, so i'm going to split this up into say n n pieces so basically that's what i've done so the last one is b okay so the idea is that uh, i am going to split up this interval into 
uh, these many pieces and then I am going to ask myself uh, what is the value of the function f at these points. So, in other words f, f of x0 is anyway y1 because that is fixed and f of xn is uh, y2 that is also fixed. But however, f of x1 can be whatever it wants to be because you see f is not fixed, f is being integrated over, f is the function. So, you are integrating over the space of all possible functions. So, that means f of x1 can be whatever it wants to be, f of x2 is independently whatever it wants to be. So, there is no connection between f of x1 and f of x2 because f, f is a very general function, it can be whatever it wants. So, so, in other words integrating over all possible functions is the same as integrating over f of x1 as if it were an independent number and it involves uh, then find, uh, successively integrating over the next one which is f of x2 as if it were a completely independent number then again independently f of x3, independently f of x4. So, as if they were all independent number all the way up, up to f of x n minus 1 because f of x n is fixed which is y2. So, f of x 1 n minus 1 is also independent of all the other numbers. So, basically that is what you end up doing. So, now uh, integral over uh, uh, integration you see when you have split up this interval into pieces then clearly integration is just uh, multiply by that. Uh, the distance between successive points which is uh, b minus is a by n and the uh, summation. So, it is basically integral becomes summation when you have discretized your interval because if you recall that that is actually how you define integration to begin with. So, I am not I mean so, I am going back to basics basically. So, uh, so that is what this is. So, that is what in ordinary integration so, remember that there are two types of integrations in 6.3, one is the ordinary integration sitting inside the exponent which is over x, but then there is the final more interesting integration over the space of all possible functions which is sitting outside there. So, when it comes to ordinary integration, it is clear that that is what it is. So, now, um, so, now we uh, now that we have discretized my our interval it becomes very easy to define what derivative is it is just the difference between you know your y values and uh, divided by the distance between successive x values. So, which is what I have written here. So, now we go ahead and uh, uh, substitute uh, here and then you have to uh, just go ahead and integrate. So, this is actually f of uh, j plus 1 and this is uh, f of j ok. So, uh, so that is what I am doing here. So, I am integrating over all possible f. Uh, so, f 0 is anyway fixed which is y 1 and f n is fixed which is y 2, but f 1 up to f n minus 1 is not fixed. So, it can be whatever it wants and in, in fact now f 1 is uh, uh, f x 1 is by definition f 1 which is a real number which is any real number ok because f is a function of a real valued function of a real number. So, now you s simply integrate over all such f's ok. So, this is f j squared this ok. So, you have to integrate over all those real numbers as if they were all independent of each other. So, now this is going to be not so easy to do because you see they are all um, coupled in the sense that um, you know if you expand this out you get a it is a whole squared there. So, if you expand this out you get uh, uh, f j plus 1 squared plus f j squared, but then there is also a cross term f j plus 1 into f j. So, that becomes not so easy to do. So, the question is how would you do that? in a convenient way is the question. So, the answer is the following. So, rather than um, do it, uh, so so there are of course, uh, you, you can do it uh, in a convenient way I mean directly also, but, but like I told you in the beginning uh, many times in physics we are not particularly interested in the this integral itself. 
rather than that we are interested in the ratio of two such integrals. So, typically in applications in physics at least we encounter not the integral of itself, but rather it is the ratio of this with something similar. So, uh, so it would be desirable therefore, to uh, rewrite this integral in such a way that um, it, uh, it is writable. So, in other words, what we do is that we rewrite this integration which we are supposed to do uh, rather than doing it fully completely, we rewrite it as a uh, part which can be done fully and completely and a part that cannot be done easily. But that part that cannot be done easily is the same that appears both in the numerator and the denominator. So, in other words, we uh, find a clever trick which enables us to write an integral that is uh, that we want to do in terms of two factors. One factor which can be done fully and completely and another factor which we cannot do completely but that same factor will appear both in the numerator and the denominator in all the applications that we are interested in. So, when that happens you see the term uh, the factor which we are unable to do easily uh, cancels out of uh, the final answer because it uh, like I told you most of the applications we are interested in ratios. So, if you are interested in ratios the, the term that we cannot do easily is of no relevance to physics and it cancels out. It's, it does not mean it is of no relevance at all because it is of relevance if you want to make sense out of functional integrals per se, but uh, that is of interest to somebody who might uh, uh, be interested in the mathematical aspects. But we are physicists and we are only I mean we want to quickly get to the physics answers as quickly as possible and pretty much all applications in physics involve ratios of such integrals and so the moment there are ratios only uh, the factors. So, in other words when you are successful in rewriting this in terms of a part that you cannot do and a part that you can do and the part that you cannot do is uh, appears in the same way in the numerator and denominator, it uh, really makes no sense to put in that effort and actually do that because it anyway cancels out. Okay, so, that is the bottom line. So, now the question is how would you accomplish whatever I said that is how would you rewrite 6.6 .6 in such a way that it is writable as a part that you can do easily times the part that you cannot do, but it is kind of universal it is there both numerator and denominator. So, how would you write it that way? So, the way to do that is the following. So, you first say that look uh, I am going to first uh, rewrite this integral in such a way that it does not correspond to. Uh, so, so the, remember the end points were y1 and y2. So, instead of uh, f of a being uh, y1, I will rewrite this in, in terms of a new function, which is basically. Uh, so, basically, what I am going to do is that I am going to find the extremum of this. Uh, so, this function. So, that means that. Uh, so, remember that I have to integral uh, integrate over all possible f's, but it is also clear from this that there will be some optimal f for which uh, uh, this integrand the one I have oval circled out in a oval shape. So, this integrand is going to uh, actually reach a minimum right. So, for a suitable f. So, it basically it, it reaches some kind of an extremum definitely. So, it reaches an extremum and I want to know what is that extremum. So, the extremum is the basically obtained by uh, assuming that f, f equal to u of x uh, is the extremum. Uh, if f of x equals u of x is that extremum. So, that means there is some, some particular cho choice of f f of x which is called u of x for which that integrand is an extremum. So, that extremum is basically obtained uh, by saying that uh, look uh, let us assume that uh, u of x is that extremum and find out uh, you know suppose if you replace uh, f by u of x plus something small. So, then you know if if indeed u of x was that extremum, 
the integrand should be quadratic in delta of u because that is what f uh, extremum means is not it like the first derivative is 0. So, uh, extremum means that uh, if u, u of x is indeed that extremum if I substitute f, f of x equals u of x plus delta u the integrand should be quadratic in not linear but quadratic. So, it is going to have a 0th order term and typically when you tailor series in delta of u you will always get a 0th order term, first order term, second order term. In this case only up to second because the integrand itself is second order. So, you will get a 0th order term, first order term, second order term, but if u of x is really the extremum the first order term should automatically drop out because that is what extremum means. So, now let us go ahead and try to uh, impose that condition and find out what u of x uh, ought to be in order for this to be an extremum. So, then uh, for that you substitute uh, this sort of uh, uh, assumption into your integrand and then you go ahead and integrate by parts and you get this, uh, this result namely that u of x is an extremum if and only if it obeys this differential equation. And then not only that you see this u of x should of course also obey the end point constraint that means u of a should be y1, u of b should be y2. So, now you can go ahead and solve this uh, simple second order differential equation linear with constant coefficients and uh, with these end point conditions and you get this result. So, this is your uh, answer I mean basically this is your answer and this is what c1 is and this is what c2 is. Okay. So, now I get back to my or original question. So, this is the f which extremizes the integrand. So, now if I want to integrate over space of all x, I write f as my uh, that unique u of x which extremizes that which is a fixed function. So, that we have found what it is, it is one unique function plus something new. So, that means f is, remember that f is in being integrated over. So, in other words, it is kind of a variable. So, but if I write f of x equals u of x plus h in this it is clear what the variable is u of x cannot possibly be a variable because that is a fixed function which we have calculated just now it is the function which extremizes the integrand. So, if I write uh, f, f of x so if I write f of x as u of x plus h so it is clear that the function uh, which extremizes uh, the integrand is fixed. So, this is fixed. So, this is variable. So, the variable is the uh, h not the u, u is fixed and f is uh, also f variable because that is what you are integrating over. So, you are integrating over all possible f's. So, you are writing f as u of x which is fixed plus h, h of x which is now the new variable. So, when you do that, when you substitute this uh, way of writing f into your original question namely uh, 6.3, you will end up with the, this integral of this sort. Okay. So, this is what I was talking about. So, typically what will happen is that in many cases, uh, you will see that uh, this is a doable integral because you have just found out what u is explicitly it is just a question of substituting and doing this. So, this is doable, doable. So, that means it is easy to perform this integration and explicitly write this number down this is, a, this is some real number. But however, this integral continues to present the same problem of course, the problem is somewhat reduced in the sense that now the end points are actually 0. So, that is the only uh, simplification here. So, because you see h is the deviation from the extremum. So, the so since f and u obey the same end point condition. So, f of a is y1 and u of a is also y1. So, it, it clearly follows therefore, that h of a should be 0 because otherwise this would not be obeyed f of a is equal to u of a equals y1 hence h of a is 0 and since f of b equals u of b equals y2 h of b is now 0. And now that h of a and h of b are both 0, so now, now we can go ahead and so I just pointed out uh, that I have split this up this integral that see what is i, i is uh, 
i is 6.3 this is what i wanted to do i wanted to integrate over all possible functions f so now i have reduced that uh, question to a question over integral over all possible functions called h but the h has uh, h is nearly uh, the same as f except that its end point conditions are simpler so its end points are all zero so the uh, what factors out is basically uh, a term which involves the function which extremizes the integrand so now the reason why this sort of a uh, transformation is useful is because you see now uh, if you have a end point condition uh, such that both the end points are zero then it's easy to use uh, fourier series to write down a very general form of h so because you see this implies now a kind of periodicity because h of a equals h of b so that means that there is in, so you can reinterpret the statement as saying that h is periodic so if h is periodic so that means its period is b minus a so if h is periodic it clearly means that you can use fourier series and uh, and in fact that fourier series will ha have only the sine function not the cosine function because the end points are actually zero so the cosine function won't give you zero at the ends so it's the sine function so it's clear that you can rewrite this h of x as a fourier series like this and it's also clear that you can easily convince yourself that this is the most general way of writing any function h of x which has this property that means h of a is 0 h of b is 0 so for any uh, general c of n you can uh, rewrite uh, so so in other words uh, this is because h of x is periodic and not only it's periodic the end points are actually zero so you can write, rewrite it not only as a fourier series but as a fourier series involving only the sine function it, you can write it as a fourier series because it's periodic you can write it as a fourier series involving only sine function because the end points are zero so now the coefficients in that fourier series are now your new variables so you see you are you are supposed to integrate over all functions h now because of this fourier representation you are now uh, called upon to integrate not over uh, all functions h but all numbers cn see that's the difference so earlier you are supposed to integrate over all functions h which is really uh, as difficult as what it was as the original question was because we were having trouble making sense of that what does it mean to integrate over all spaces of functions what does that even mean but what we have now succeeded in doing by writing this as a series is that now you just have to integrate over all these coefficients which happen to be numbers but uh, of course the um difficulty which still persists is that the number of such coefficients is discrete but infinite uh, but at least it is discrete so it makes sense we can do it one by one and you of course you have to keep doing it ad infinitum so now uh, whatever it is we should still uh, plod along and see where it takes us so let's go ahead and substitute this h of x into our various formulas and then the integrand becomes this okay so now uh, it's just a question of doing this so you see now the advantage of this is that you see this uh, integrand now is doable for the simple reason that uh, the integrand is now diagonal in so there there is no cross talk it's not like there is uh, c of n and c n plus 1 so it's not like cn plus 1 minus cn whole squared so it's just cn squared right so if it was cn plus 1 minus cn whole squared you would get cn plus 1 into cn and uh, that would be difficult to do and uh, so that's that's the sort of integration we had to do right at the beginning i mean if you are if you had naively tried to do it uh, involving you, you know using only integral over that f1 f2 up to fn minus 1 you were unsuccessful simply because say, it involved handling integrals which had this mixture of fn and or fj and fj plus 1 uh, so that was the difficulty 
But now what you have done through these series of clever uh, transformations is you have reduced it first of all to an integral that is extremely easy to do because u of x is the function that extremizes the integrand. But you also succeed in, in replacing the remaining part in terms of an integral over a discrete set of real numbers. And because of that you can just do it over one of the CNs and it is a product of all because remember uh, this is nothing but uh, right integral uh, exponential of the sum of a whole bunch of things is the product of the exponential of one of those things right. So, so it is like uh, you know a1 plus a2 plus dot 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 plus a n is nothing but e raised to a i product i 1 to n. So, e raised to summation a i is same as product of e raised to a i. So, whatever that is what that is. So, instead of writing e raised to summation I have written product over all the n's, but then I have to if integrate over the c n's. So, if I integrate over c n I get this then I have to find the product over all n's. So, this is the end result uh, right or wrong this is the answer I meaning uh, wrong in the sense that this will then this may not converge. But uh, in so far as uh, you can make sense out of this in, in some other way uh, this is all there is to it. So, this is the answer. So, it is quite remarkable that we were successful you see we were earlier asking what is the answer to 6.3 and what is 6.3 this integrate uh, this uh, e raised to minus 1 half capital A uh, times some integrand which involves some function f of x over the space of all possible functions f. So, it is a formidable ask, it is a formidable question to answer until you realize that you can successively make transformations which will then reduce this question to a very doable set of integrations which you can explicitly do and then you can actually write down the answer to 6.3 and that answer is 6.17. This is explicit because everything here is known, everything here is also known because you know what is u of x and what is u of x? It is the function that makes the integrand an extremum. So, this u of x is this where c1 is this and c2 is this. So, that is the beauty of this, uh, this kind of an approach that it explicitly allows you to evaluate integrations over function spaces. So, this is one way of making sense out of integration of function spaces. But like I was repeatedly pointing out that in physics we are typically not interested in uh, the answer to 6.3 itself, but rather than the ratio of that with something similar. So, typically what will happen is that we are interested we are usually this integrand will be uh, some kind of a probability. So, in other words this, this sort of a term which appears again and again in statistical mechanics and in quantum mechanics uh, especially quantum field theory this will have the interpretation as the probability of finding the function to be uh, between f and f plus d f. So, this is like uh, something like uh, probability of finding. So, if if a situation arises, if a situation arises where the probability of finding uh, a function f to have the value of f uh, between f and f plus d f given by this. So, in other words if the probability of finding the function f to be between f and f plus d f is this, then you can ask the question what is the average value of f right because f is some random it is like it has now the quest the question is, uh, is, is posed in a way as if f is now a random function of x. So, now because it is random it can have an average, it will not have a well defined value, but it can have an average well defined value, it is it's average can be well defined because f is just like any other random number. So, if it is a random number the number itself is not well defined, 
but its average is well defined. So similarly here f is not a random number but a random function. So if it is a random function its, uh, its explicit form is not uh, well defined because it is random but however its average functional form is well defined. So that is typically what we are interested in say in 6.19. So we would actually want to calculate this. Okay. So now you can see that if you wish to calculate this, it involves the ratios of two things which are similar looking and uh, more generally you can actually calculate the average of something like this which will involve, so you can actually calculate average of x, f of i or you can calculate f, average of f of y and f of z like that. So more generally you can calculate average of uh, something called the generating function. So you can generate all this by appropriately differentiating u of x as many times as you want. So this is a convenient thing to calculate because you can get anything else out of this because it, this generates the, all the moments of f. So uh, you see um, in order to do this we can uh, now, uh, so I am going to use that uh, transformation trick which it re rewrites f in terms of its extremum which is u of x plus that variation h. So if you rewrite it that way then you can rewrite it like this and then you e explicitly write h in terms of your cns but because of that you see uh, you can go ahead and uh, so I will allow you to uh, work out this, this relation. So that means what I have done is I have written uh, this, this is the average, so this average means uh, so like this, so, you, so instead of this you put uh, this one, right. So instead of average of f, you put uh, average of this quantity. So average means you have to integrate over that uh, all possible integrands, right. So I forgot an integral here, so there is an integral implied, okay. So it is integral over all possible h's now. So now if you recall that h can be written as a Fourier series involving only the sin function. So when you do that you are able to rewrite uh, this in terms of u of n and so on. So now this is easy to do, why is this easy to do? For the same reason because there is no mixture here, so this uh, numerator is easy to do. Uh, the denominator we already did if you recall we got this answer, this is what that is. So this is the denominator, I mean denominator means this one, this we already did. So the denominator of 6.21 right hand side is basically this whatever I am circling now. But the numerator has this additional term which is this. But then uh, that is just a shifted Gaussian, so you just shift it and you get the sensor. So you see the thing, nice thing about this is that when you shift it, you get this times something which is same as denominator and they cancel out. And if you recall that I told you that denominator is this hideous looking product which is actually formally divergent. So you would have actually had trouble making further sense out of 6.17 beyond what I have written here if you closely examine this product it is divergent. So you would actually be stuck at this stage because you would not know how to make further sense out of this. But fortunately in physics we really uh, rarely encounter uh, an integral such as this uh, 6.17 itself but rather we typically encounter ratios because we are typically interested in average, average is just uh, you know s integral of something divided by the normalization which is also another integration. So it is basically the ratios of two similar integrations and so you will end up having uh, something very sensible times a divergent quantity and in the denominator also something sensible times the same divergent quantity. So therefore both the numerator and denominator the serious looking divergent quantities appear exactly the same way in numerator and denominator and they cancel out and when they cancel out you get this very sensible uh, meaningful expression for a very meaningful question namely if the probability of uh, 
the random function having values between f and f plus df is given by this, what is the average of this quantity? So that is the question. So g of u is the average of that quantity. So the answer to that question is namely very precisely this. So this is a perfectly non-divergent, sensible, completely meaningful answer. 6.22 is the answer to that question. So this is basically the answer to the question, what is the average, what is this? So that is the, this is a sensible question and this is the sensible answer to that sensible question. And it is sensible because you know what u of x is. So u of x is basically the function which uh, makes the integrand an extremum. Okay. So that is the bottom line. So and what is uh, u subscript n? It's basically the, you know, the Fourier transform of u of x. I mean, basically, it's given by this. You can call it whatever you want. So um, yeah. So that's the answer. That's the complete story. So it's a sensible question, this is the sensible answer to that question. So like I told you, the reason why we are interested in this is because you see, uh, uh, you know, you can always uh, say, for example, if you are interested in the average of f of x, you simply calculate the derivative of g of u with respect to u of x, and then you set u of, uh, set u itself to be 0, then you get the average of f of x. So you can easily convince yourself of that. So because you see this is nothing but g of u is nothing but this average. Okay. So it's just the average, this is g of u. So if you differentiate with respect to u of x, you bring down f of x and then if you after bringing down f of x, you set u equal to 0, this becomes 1 and then what you end up is finding an average of f of x. Similarly, if you differentiate with so u of x, u of y, you bring down an f of x and then you bring down an f of y and then finally set, you set u equal to 0, you are finding the average of f of x times f of y. So you can also uh, actually first take log and do certain things, then that will give you actually what are called the connected moments. So basically it will tell you, uh, so if you take log and then you differentiate what you are going to get is not the average of x uh, this, but rather this what is called the connected moment f of x, uh, f of y, etc, etc. For higher moments also you can similarly define the connected moments if you first take the log and then differentiate and then you put u equal, of course I should not forget to put u equal to 0 at the end, I mean that is implied. I am going to stop here because uh, uh, this is a good place to stop because I have told you exactly what functional integration is and uh, how do you go, go about uh, doing it in uh, simple cases where say the integrands are typically Gaussians and how to make sense of uh, functional integral as a sequence of ordinary integrations. So that was the important uh, first step in making sense out of uh, functional integrations. So now that, uh, so now once you are equipped to do functional integrations, you can go ahead and actually start doing quantum mechanics using Lagrangians instead of Hamiltonians. So now you have the mathematical tools needed to reinterpret quantum mechanics in terms of Lagrangians rather than from Hamiltonians. So, which is typically what you learn in uh, your uh, undergraduate uh, courses. So, I am teaching you a new perspective to quantum mechanics, which is basically quantum mechanics using Lagrangians. But then the reason why it is not taught in your undergraduate courses is because it involves knowing how to integrate spaces of functions. So, so it requires this technical new ingredient. So, which now that you know what it is, you can go ahead and uh, rewrite quantum mechanics in terms of integration over, in terms of Lagrangians. So, uh, so what I am going to, I am going to eventually get to that, but in the next class what I am going to do is, I am going to try and explain to you how to do integration over spaces of functions when the integrand in question is not uh, Gaussian, but something slightly more complicated. 
because if it's Gaussian, everything is uh, very nice and clean. But then, uh, typically, uh, in uh, many applications, you will find that uh, the integrands are typically harder than Gaussians. So, because if it's Gaussian, it's exactly doable, and uh, there are no surprises. But then, many many interesting applications in physics uh, involve surprises, and surprises typically come when the integrands are not Gaussians. So they're more complicated, or they're Gaussian plus something beyond a Gaussian. So in the next class, I'll tell you how to uh, treat such problems perturbatively. So the word perturbation uh, ought to be familiar to you because that's that comes from quantum mechanics. At least uh, it's very frequently used in quantum mechanics, and perturbation is uh, also a common theme. In this particular course, you will see that I'll uh, occasionally use perturbation theory to make sense out of problems which are not doable exactly. So, one such uh, application will be the next class where I'll explain to you how to use perturbation theory to make sense out of sen uh, integrating over functions where the integrand is not necessarily a Gaussian. Okay, I'm going to stop uh, here now. I hope to join you for the next class. Thank you.